Okay, so welcome to the seventh of this, this summer's 2016 Digital Classicist Seminars in London. Uh, we're very happy this week to be joined by Daniel Pett from the British Museum and George Oates from the Museum in a Box um, company, um, who are going to talk to us about 3D in museums and museums in 3D. They'll probably talk about something slightly more interesting than that, than that title, which I think I actually made up for them. But, um, in any case, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll pass over to them to uh, what they're actually talking about. Thank you, Gabby, for the invitation to come speak to the digital classes again. Uh, this is my second time coming to talk to this group, and hopefully, if I'm speaking too fast, you'll tell me, and if I'm garbling, also tell me as well. Now, I'm going to try and talk about what we've been doing in the British Museum, which is just behind us, uh, for 3D over the last year and a half. Uh, some of the people have inspired me in this room today. Um, Addy, who's in the front row at the moment, uh, George sitting next to me. Uh, and 3D is something that we've gone on a little journey at the British Museum. It's a new thing. And we do some very different things with 3D within the museum environment. Now, the very first slide that I'm going to show you, this is a 3D point cloud of the museum that's been taken out of LiDAR data. We're now trying to work out how we can start using 3D for the museum in different ways. This is a very interesting aspect of 3D for us, LiDAR. This has allowed us to actually build a world in Minecraft. We've converted this 3D model of the museum into a Minecraft representation of what the museum looks like. We're now inviting children, adults, whoever wants to play Minecraft, to come and start building the interior of the museum in 3D objects into the museum environment. Now recently I had an eight-year-old come to stay with me and I got him to start playing Minecraft. I was amazed at how fast he was playing with it. He's putting in basic programming commands so fast I couldn't read what he was doing. And he told me I've done the 3D all wrong and I need to start again. I think he might become our Minecraft consultant for the museum and actually show us how we're going to start making inroads into this sort of world. And recently, I'm going to go back to this as well, but Pokemon started working in this area. I downloaded it and started playing it before it became live. You walk around the museum now and everyone's looking at their phones. They're mombies. They're looking at their phones, walking to objects, walking to each other. Now there's a game that they're starting to play as well. Are they looking at the objects? Or are they looking at their computers, their laptops, whatever they're playing Pokemon on? And not really interacting with what the objects are. And this is one of the problems with 3D as well. If we do a 3D object, are we talking what the real thing in the museum is? Are people just going to look at the 3D object and think, I don't need to go and see these objects? I don't believe so. This is some of the criticism. So let's begin with a few sceptics. And when I first started on 3D, I was one of those sceptics. I didn't really see the point. And then I started working on a project called Micropast with a few people who have been doing 3D for a while. And it really changed my mind about what 3D could do. Some of you might know this chap, Mark Carnell. Now he's quite an infamous curator on Twitter. He has a dig at people who are digital quite regularly. He makes me think constantly about what I'm trying to do. And I think he's very accurate here. Are 3D objects becoming one of those things that you just do, just throw away and leave lying around? Now, if anyone comes up to my office, they'll see a huge array of white plastic shapes. They aren't accessioned, they're just on my desk for people to see. George has got some of these for her museum in the box, and she's going to talk about those later. Addy's got some of these presents at home. We did some stuff in 3D gypsum printing, which I'm going to talk about. It. And it's really good stuff. It is going to be used. It might be in storage, but it is going to be used. I do see from now on that we are going to start accessioning objects for the museum collection. We do a really high class print for certain objects. Someone's going to say we need to keep that as well because it goes with the object record. Sometimes it's one that we can handle and do various things with. It's just an XKCD cartoon. So 3D printers, they are changing all the time. There's not very good cartoons out there. This is the only reasonably funny one I could find. It's not that funny, but it gives you an idea. We actually haven't started doing any models of 3D fallacies yet. But some people have suggested we should do more of these. But yeah, it's an interesting thing to start thinking about. But we're not the pioneers of 3D in the museum. Lots of people have been doing 3D already. This is an interesting scene. This is a Southampton University team that modeled the great Moai. The Moai is one of the most interesting models that we've had in the, our collection. And Tom Flynn, who works with George, has modeled this twice now. Different quality of detail. And these guys have actually got to the top. It's a very tall subject. We can't reach it normally. Thomas has managed to get up to, to the sort of flat part of his head but can't get the very top of it. So he doesn't know what's there. But his model has been printed off around the world. It's been on the Jimmy Fun Show. It sits on my desk. I think I've got about 20 copies now. I've made chocolates out of it. I've done all sorts of things. This paper is published in antiquity as well, so you can read it and see how they did their methodology. And they use a method called photogrammetry, which I'm going to talk about through this. 
We've also had 3D prints of coin hoards within the museum as well. This is one of the Bow Street hoards from Bath, and that's how it's found. It just shows you what it looks like. The 3D is also allowing us to start doing non-invasive um, discovery of coin hoards as well. Now, over at the museum, I used to work for the Port Antiquities Department, and we're very pressed for finances to do the conservation of hoards. But if a museum is going to acquire it, we need to know what's in that hoard. And this pot came out of the ground like this. It was put through a CT scanner and allowed the curators to work out what the coins were within the pot. Is it worth excavating that coin hoard for the curators to actually think about acquiring? Or are they really boring, grotty radiates or mummy? It allowed us to actually say what was in it. Again, that's work by Southampton University. And then we've had some big companies coming in, like SIARC, who scanned our Syrian antiquities. And this data, as far as I understand it, is locked away. We can't use it for open data. This is something else I'm also really keen on, open data. So what methods are we using within the British Museum at the moment? Now, I've been learning from colleagues how to do this stuff. We're trying to do stuff on a budget. We don't want to go really high-end equipment because we can't afford it. Our colleagues can't afford to go out and buy a laser scanner. It takes more time to set up. So we're trying to use normal equipment. So we're using photogrammetry, which is just using normal camera, a mobile phone. You can use a mobile phone if you want to do. Gabby's sitting there on his phone at the moment, probably tweeting away. But he can make a 3D model using the camera on his phone if he wanted to, using very simple software that you can just download. This object down here is an old gold cape. Now, I'm very lucky when I got to do a photo model of this, it actually came out. It's gold, it's reflective, and this is one of the challenges that you have. We've also found that museum lighting is particularly poor for doing 3D models. This one at the top came out very yellow. If you go and look at this sculpture, it's a particularly white shade of uh, marble. We've also been doing medical imaging as well. Mummies are a fantastic resource for doing medical imaging with. We can take off their wrappings, we can take them out sarcophagi, we can peel away the skin, we can put them on display in galleries. We've got touch tables where you can peel away the layers and turn them around. We've made great discoveries over the last few years working on what was inside the mummies, how they were killed. Gebeline Mann's had a puncture wound in his shoulder we wouldn't have known about if we didn't do this 3D work. Now feasibly, you could print off the skeleton and do all sorts of human remains type things with this if you wanted to. You could send it out to a school for them to learn more about. You could do different things. We've also been experimenting with things like Artex scanners. So this is again is the Egyptian mummies. Uh, Daniel Antoine, who used to be a curator, but he's a curator at the British Museum, he used to work at UCL. He's been doing stuff where he's had a friend from uh, Toulouse University come in and scan the outside of these mummies produce a 3D model that we can actually use in the gallery or wherever we want to. So this is an example of a point cloud and the mesh that I got from one of the objects within the Egyptian gallery. This took me 15 minutes to produce. I went around with a Nikon D5100. I took 102 photos and produced this together. Yeah, come in. And we're now on the road to regular 3D production. Now, this has been inspired by projects that I've worked with, and a few individuals as well. Uh, Tom Flynn, again, who I mentioned, works with George. He's inspired me greatly with the work I'm doing. He's taught me lots of things. Addie in the front row has taught me lots of stuff. She's now working at the British Library and implementing 3D there. I think it's been a new road for the British Library. Have they done 3D in the past? I'm not sure if they have. CT scan, yes. CT scan. So it's interesting seeing how people are changing and they're following each other. If you look at Sketchfab, museums are joining all the time. They reached 300 museums or cultural institutions on Sketchfab yesterday. This is a sharing platform for 3D technology. But what I want to do is make the museum self-sustainable. We don't need me or another person, member of staff who knows how to do it. I want every curator to be able to make a 3D model if they want to. And we are using things like Micropass, which is crowdsourcing for 3D technology, to make 3D models. So this is one of the applications that uh, Addy and I and a chap called Andy Bevan produced, where you draw around the outside of a photograph and produce a photo mask. It produces a GeoJSON uh, export of data and produces a photo mask that you can then put in something called Agisoft PhotoScan and produce a 3D model. It's pretty simple, but you allow the public to do this for you. So you're farming the work out to other people, unknown people that you don't really have any close ties with. But they're very willing to help. This is an Egyptian object from Turin. We're working with lots of museums around the world now. We've produced over 100 models using crowdsourcing technology. It's fantastic to see people buying into this. We could do more. And at the moment, the British Museum is not promoting this in a big enough way. But I think in the next few months, we might see more and more stuff going through our crowdsourcing platform and hopefully being used by things like your project. We then decided to go off and build our own viewers so we could view our 3D technology or 3D models. Now, this is really nice. It has some really good uh, features on it, so you can measure the objects. You can't do this in many online uh, viewers. But we realised we weren't reaching a large audience. There's 66 million people in the UK. This was viewed by about 150. 
we're not reaching a big crowd. Sketchfab, for instance, is a big platform. It has 100,000 registered users on it. That's still quite small, but it's a lot more than we were getting on our platform. So we went where they were going to be. So we thought to put our models up here. Much nicer interface, more features that you could use. People could embed those models on their website. We can bring them back into ours. It's a much larger audience, higher quality. And it allowed us to annotate the models as well. This is one of the MicroPass models. It's a gold bracelet. You could put annotations on these models to tell the curator, or the curator could tell you as an audience, more about the object. It allows Addy, for instance, to impart their knowledge about a Bronze Age object to someone who doesn't know enough about it. We could even crowdsource these annotations if we wanted to via our interface and say, you know more about these objects. Could someone else do this for us? So we started putting up our content on Sketchfab and putting it up on a really open license. Sebastian Heath is a scholar in New York. And he's really inspired me in my work in the past, and Gabby knows him very well as well. We put stuff under a CC BY license. This is at odds to the rest of the museum content. We're under a CC BY non-commercial share of light license, which limits how you can use it. But we decided from the start, we wanted to be a very open project. We want to work with open source technology, open data, and open license. But over at the British Museum, we are hampered by new EU legislation. It makes it hard for us to share stuff, and it's affecting your projects in some ways, but not in others. And we're now trying to extend 3D outside what we're doing traditionally. So we're starting to bring the models back into our collection interfaces as well. This is an example of the Port Antiquity Scheme. This is the hoard where these objects came from. We now have an image of the object. We have the text of the object. We have a 3D model of the object. You as a curator or researcher can download that 3D model, print it on your printer at work if you've got one, or, or send it off to a broker. And you can have a handling collection that you can teach your students with. You could do it in color. You could do it in plastic, you could do it in nylon, whatever you want. And we're now starting to push data off into different platforms as well. The Bronze Age models that MicroPass produced are now being used in virtual reality environments. This was at the British Museum. Uh, this was a sort of dome that was in the Great Court for one day only. People went inside wearing these Samsung headsets. Well, we have a relationship with Samsung, so we use their technology. And they were wearing these headsets and they were navigating the environment, seeing the Bronze Age objects in what they imagined would be the environment. So my wife looking rather happy. She'd never looked at VR before. And she was amazed when she first started playing with it. You're going to start seeing this more often. There's things like Microsoft HoloLens, where you can explore Mars, the Mars Explorer for NASA. It's on BBC Click of the night. And you can actually walk around the environment and interact with other people. So the potential is starting to change. And you can also do augmented reality as well. This is some work by Tom Flynn, using the objects to scan. And we're now starting to put multilingual labels on our objects as well. So if you go across the road now, and you go to room three, which is just by the entrance, there's an exhibition about Japanese uh, pottery, Kaikamon. In that exhibition, we've got a 3D model with a URL on the wall. You can download and play with. We put the annotations on in Japanese, so we've got a different audience. We can share our knowledge to lots of different places. And again, in room three, we had an exhibition about a Pacific god called Aa. Uh, Tom Finn modeled this object. It's extremely tricky. It comes in two parts, it's very delicate, it's sacred to some people, possibly had human remains inside it at some point. He did a 3D model. And this little brown object that you can see printed on the left hand side was live streamed as someone did it in their own workshop online. It's quite boring watching a 3D print going, but some people like watching these videos. He finished it, and about four weeks later in the post, I got a parcel with that object saying, Here you are, it's a donation to the museum. The curator's having this, and it probably will be accessioned to go in the collection, so you can send it off to different places. This is an AR version of that object as well. And we're now starting to put objects on the handling desk as well. This is an interesting example. This is again another model of Tom Flynn. Uh, this is a 3D representation of a townhouse. Uh, different materials here. So that's a plastic print on the top right hand side. Plastic prints are pretty unsatisfying for lots of people. But on the left, you've got a gypsum print, which is shown here on the bottom. It's colour printed. It actually gives people more of a view of what it looks like. So if you go across to see the Sunken Cities exhibition, Go up to the handling desk in, in the entrance for you and ask to see this townhouse. You can handle it. Turn it over. It weighs two kilograms. It's nearly the same weight as the actual object. People are actually quite pleased they can handle this thing. It's on display in the Nebenman Gallery, just so you can actually feel the sort of object. And then you can start having a bit of fun with objects as well. So I decided to start making moulds of the objects, I start making chocolates. So we had a bake-off competition for the museum. I didn't win. But I decided I was going to, was going to make uh, axes and uh, Easter Island statue and a few other things. I put it in for the competition just to show people what we can do with 3D printing. So this picture up here on the top right hand side, this is a silicon mould. You can buy this paste directly from Amazon, it's about £15 for a tub. 
I took the plastic prints and the gypsum prints, pushed, pushed them into the material, let it set, and then made a chocolate mold and then sprayed them gold. It's very simple to do. It's something we can start doing in the BM shop where we make chocolates out of BM objects. You can have a, a box of chocolate. You could, you could be a Roman, Romanist to go, I'd like a box of Roman sculpture, please, for Christmas. And we could do it on demand. So you could, they don't actually have stock. You could buy it online. We'd have to keep it in, in, in our stock room, wasting time. So I know you work for the Greek Roman department. You might be your favourite objects, and you could download them from our collection and send them off to be printed. Um, we have a really fantastic sculpture called Molossian Hound with Jennings' dog. I spent an hour taking photographs of that. I'm really trying to get BM Shop to print that at large enough size that we can make concrete moulds and sell them for people to put in their back garden. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic to have one of those dogs on the side of your, your hallway? And this example of in-house printing. So this is quite low-res printing. This is a top-end consumer uh, printer. It costs three thousand pounds. We bought this with Microsoft's uh, HRC funding. It's not overused. We've got multiple colours. We can do it purple. We can do it black. We can do it white. We can do it red. Whatever you really fancy. You can also print in a wood filament as well. So you can do things where you can drill the three D prints afterwards and put them together in different ways. And these are examples of the high end prints. So here's the Molossian Hound. This is a very small example. Done in gypsum. It's about that big. And then we have three different ones here. These are Dirks. This is one of the very first models we did for Microfast. We were amazed this one came out because it's quite thin. On the left-hand side is a printing knife. In the middle, it's a gypsum print covered in surfboard wax and painted and coloured white. You could colour these any colour you wanted to. So if you decided you wanted one at home in an art print with, say, Andy Warhol print on the outside, we could wrap that round it and give you a sort of pastiche different object that you want. And the, on the far right-hand side is one that we broke. So we dropped this. It was on the handling desk. Someone dropped it. Who cares? It's a 3D print. It's just a bit of money. If it's a real object and we break it, the conservancy team would go absolutely mad at us. And actually, we wouldn't be able to put these out again on the handling desk. Uh, recently, we had um, a figure of ISIS on the handling desk of the Egyptian exhibition until someone realised how much it was worth. We've now taken it off the 3D desk, off the desk, and I'm producing a 3D model that we printed next month, and they can put it back out there in a case that you can't touch, but you can touch the 3D print instead. These are other examples of 3D prints that we're doing for our Micropass project. These are Bronze Age objects. Now, this one here is a substitute bracelet. We're not actually sure how people wore these. So what we can do is we can print it off. We can go to a group of people and say, how would you use this? So you might wear it as like a, a toggle around your neck with a scarf. Someone else might use it for putting around their arm. So you can do some experimental archaeology very easily. And it doesn't matter if it gets broken. We just print another one. And this is an example of what's going on now. So this is the big crate is what people are doing. Now, we try some stuff out of the museum, because if we don't do it now, we do it in five months' time, probably miss the boat. So we might as well get on board with the craze and see what happens. It'll probably peter out and die in five months for most people, but someone's always going to keep playing it, but maybe not as many masses. So that's it from me, and I'm now going to pass over to George. So we're just going to get on the ground. Thanks, Dan. Hi, my name's George Oates. It's all up there. I've got a company here in London, just around the corner, actually. It's called Museum in a Box, and we're trying to do just what that is, put museums into boxes. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a sort of a history of where we're at and show you some of the experiments in product development that we've been doing, and um, our, we brought a demo box that we can play with afterwards while we have a glass of wine and a chat. Um, so yeah, uh, I just thought you might be interested to see how we're taking work like Dan's and my co-founder Tom, who Dan mentioned a fair bit, and trying to uh, just make more of it, basically. Um, so the, the first experiment started last year in March in 2015. Um, and this was a, a, a little residency that we did for two weeks at Somerset House. We, we were given this space for free, which was super nice. Um, so we used that table as our museum, um, and our collection was a set of 10 3D printed objects from the British Museum collection, which you can see at the front down in that, uh, in that pot. And each day we would cover the museum with a new piece of brown paper and take one of the objects out of the box and make an egg exhibit about it and then the next day and then the next day. Um, I, that's the mysterious Tom Flynn who we've mentioned many times and our other co-conspirator Harriet. Um, the three of us just spent our time doing that. Um, and there's a little more close-up uh, version of the models but this was um, 
even just having a collection of 3D printed things was quite interesting for the general public who wandered in because um, many people still even haven't actually seen a 3D printed thing before. So just that was interesting for us. But yeah, we spent the, the couple of weeks um, doing a bunch of experiments and I'd like to show you uh, a couple in particular because we started playing with the concept of using the replica objects themselves to trigger some kind of experience. So I'm going to try a video and I hope it works. Um, let's see. Uh, so one day during those two weeks we spent doing Internet of Things related experiments. So this is, this is one I'd like to show you. The Rosetta Stone, translation of the demotic text, year 9, Zandicus day 4, which is equivalent to the Egyptian month, second month of Peret, day 80. Colossal foot, Roman, 1st to 2nd century AD. Right foot wearing Greek sandals. So it's a very simple prototype where the 3D prints just have a little sensor stuck to the bottom of them. And that green sort of plasticky thing you see you can read those those chips and um, know which object it is that they are supposed to be dealing, dealing with. And then they just read you a, a, a little bit of text. But the next experiment was about um, the nature of the object itself. And the interface we designed was about that object. So it wasn't just reading your label, but it was a little more detailed. I think we just do it to search. All right, you ready? Everyone ready? Mm -hmm. Now we have to say, why is the Bible trying to find out what is this now? Is it all the Egypt or is it just this one? Well, that's the reason why we have to get the Bible to find out what is going on in the Bible. We have to get the Bible to find out what is going on in the Bible. This is the creed that a festival shall be kept in the temples throughout Egypt on these days and every month, on which there shall be sacrifices. So, turns out the text of the Rosetta Stone is pretty boring, <laughs> if you read the whole thing, to some, of course. Um, but yeah, so each object we uh, each day, excuse me, we would pick, pick one of our um, collection objects, and we would do research using the British Museum website about the real thing, and just use the three D printed object as a as a sort of a talisman in in the museum space. Um, this was one of my favourites. This was um, about uh, actually the object I was just showing you, a Nandi bull. Uh, Nandi is the steed of Shiva. And um, we wanted to contrast uh, this piece, this object's real life before it was acquired by the museum and its permission uh, and its new position in the museum. So um, we just made this little display to give you an example of the type of displays that we made. It's mostly blue. So that's the label text that you would see if you read the uh, went to the museum. So the point that we're trying to make is that, you know, this object in its uh, natural habitat was sort of covered in life and smoke and whispers and food and people and when you see it in the beard, no offence, Dan, it's in a sort of a cold corner um, at the back of the Great Court. But now, because I've did, done this project, every time I go past him, I always say hello because mm -hmm. I feel some connection to him. Um, and this is a work we, we did with the Colossal Foot using a tool called Augment, which um, Tom and Dan have already been doing some experiments with. But uh, we did this on the last day, I think, and this was the, the, peop the, this was the experiment that people responded to most clearly and most quickly uh, because you can project uh, the objects in real size into a space. Yourself. 
Oh, I've got my finger over the camera. That's not good. The model's still there, but it's kind of not attached to the... If you move that up and down, does it move? Oh, there we go. Yeah, now if you put it on like flat, like you're re-holding it. <laughs> really hard. And then turn it around, like, uh, yep, keep going, keep going. Is it kicking me in the face? Ah, oh, this is very, very gently funny. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> That's awesome. Is it kicking me in the face? <laughs> anyway. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was really uh, instantly informative to be able to see a thing that is printed at this size in its actual size. And scale is an issue, I think, for 3D prints because you can't always tell how big the things actually are, and that's a, an ongoing question. Um, but, yeah, it was really fun at Somerset House. And um, these, this is Arthur and Henry Maxwell, Harriet's two boys, and they just took to these things like a duck to water. And on that day, you can see on the, on the museum table there, we've, we just invented a, a little game for them to play, which is basically about classification. You know, which of these things do you think are made of marble? What's the biggest? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and this idea of museum in a box was so compelling to Arthur and Henry that the next day Harriet brought back to us the Arthur and Henry Maxwell bequest, which was a museum in a box that they themselves had made uh, overnight. And you can see there, there's a, a car sticker and a little shell and a little uh, medicine squirter and a bit of Lego. But anyway, that was the first uh, acquisition of our small museum. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so that's another point about this idea is that museums in boxes is a new concept. You know, museums have been giving handling collections out to schools for years and years and years, maybe even a hundred years. And so we just want to sort of play on that existing idea and all the processes that accompany that, um, but just turn it up a notch. So it took us a while to come back to the idea. This is in November of last year when we began to think through a little bit about the interaction design. And this was a set of 3D prints of statues of women in London, which is actually in this box here. And we just sort of started thinking, well, what, how can we take the experiments we were doing at Somerset House and that sense of interactivity and turn it into something fun? Uh, at that point, we we're also looking into sort of the different quality of prints, 3D prints that are available to us at that time. Um, and these are some of those nice gypsum prints that uh, Dan also had seen. But they're, they're bloody expensive, and they're still bloody expensive. So, you know, to, like that, that little set there, hundreds of, hundreds of quid, which is too expensive for a consumer product. So we're like, uh-oh, <laughs> we might have killed our own idea uh, just because of the expense of 3D printing. Um, but in any case, we started to flesh out the sort of technology behind the idea as well. And these, these are all uh, prototypes of what we call the brain, which is a little computer that lives in these boxes. And that's the thing that can tell you stuff about the objects. So these are three different form factors of that brain. And inside the brain, on the right hand side, you, you see a computer called a Raspberry Pi, which you might be familiar with. Quite a powerful little thing, which is good. And that, there's the green blob up there. The green square is the reader that can process the, which objects it's looking at. Um, these are the guts. So you've got the reader, the Pi. There's an SD card to put media on and power, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, so just sort of starting to flesh out what actually is quite simple technology. Um, and this is just a, a bit of a curveball, this idea of scale. Um, this is a little project that we did for the British Museum. It's a, it's a web-based project, so not a physical thing at all. It's virtual, only exists on the web. But it's this idea of trying to communicate scale in a digital context. So we came up with the idea of a universal object, which we thought a pretty universal, at least for a lot of us, is a tennis ball. And so the tennis ball itself scales with the size of the object. Um, um, and yeah, this idea of scale, I'll come back to in a moment. But yeah, so we've, we founded a company, it's Museum in a Box. We got some stickers made, which is always the sort of first, this is, this is a real startup when you have some stickers. Um, we were at the British Museum last year in December at a conference called Remix, which was also really good because it forced us to describe what the hell we were trying to do uh, to people we didn't know. We made a website. Um, and one of the features on the website is, that I think is interesting and has potential legs, is this thing we call a, a boop, which is any time you press an object onto the brain, we call that a boop. And each boop is registered in this general place at Museum in a Box. So later on, when we've got 
uh, tens of thousands of objects in schools all over the world and the kids are using the objects, we'll know and each of the kids will also know who's using the same object as them and where they are and, you know, I just think it, it opens up a really interesting potential for these things to be like little receivers, you know. If, if Dan's in Wichita and he's got one of these and George is in Melbourne and she's got one of those, if they're both booping the thing at the same uh, general time, what does that mean? You know, could they actually have a chat about it some, in somehow? Um, yeah, so we're sort of interested in the potential of 3D in terms of um, bringing the museum directly into the classroom. You know, what does it mean if, if every school in, across the UK has a hoa huck and an eye in it? You know, maybe not every kid can get to the British Museum and see the amazing thing there. So can we reverse the, the tide and send the museum to, out into schools instead? Um, and, you know, can we, can we break the idea of scarcity around objects by just making loads of copies of them? You know, and if we do, what does that mean? Uh, is it a good thing? I mean, nobody could replace going to visit Hoa in, in, the, in the Welcome Gallery there in the BN because it's wondrous. Uh, but if you can't get there, maybe we bring the object to you. Um, yeah, so as I said, the, the museum uh, in a box idea is new. This is an example from the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where they've made uh, what they call Fitz kits, which uh, these are just pretty hardy little given to families who come to the museum. But I, was, I sort of had to, I was a bit disappointed because they've just sort of got generic toys in them. <laughs> And so I'm like, well, what if you had an actual thing from the Fitzwilliam in the box instead? You know, what would that, would it help the kids maybe find the object a bit more easily? Or, you know, it could equally be a monster, as scary as Cerberus probably. But, you know, so there's a, there's a very simple example of where we might be able to insert 3D into an existing context of the sort of work that the museum's already doing. Um, but, yeah, then we got our first commission, which is super exciting from our, our friend Anne, um, her husband Russell gave us a commission because she turned 50. Um, so we, uh, we made her a box called Big Stuff from the British Museum uh, because she doesn't really like small things. <laughs> she's, she's actually got a sort of a phobia about like coins jingling in her pocket and stuff like that. Any little things she's like, a bit uneasy about. So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll just give you a box of big stuff. <laughs> um, so these these objects, most of them are, uh, you can see them and, and, I mean, you're not supposed to touch them, but you can get close to them in the British Museum. So they were um, accessible to us. Some of them had actually already been scanned by other people and were already available on, on the web. But yeah, we just sort of played with that sense of scale here. Like, so, all the prints in the set were printed at relative scale, so you can use each object to see how big the other stuff was. Um, so the, the colossal foot, which you saw a photograph of, that's sort of ironically the smallest object in the collection. Um, we also were, just like the tennis ball back in that other website, we used a phone box as our scale object. So if you're a London or if you have visited London, this is a bit London-centric, but you get the concept, you know, we just insert an object that the people can use to, to figure out how big things are. And in the end, we actually took a scan of Anne herself, who's 160 centimetres tall, and we printed her and replaced the phone box with Anne herself so she could see um, how big she was. And that actually works quite well. Uh, this is a print. Um, it's actually made of recycled car dashboards, and that's the Lion of Nidos, which you can see in the Great Court um, if you go inside the front door and turn left. But yeah, as I said before, um, 3D printing is pretty expensive and sometimes it's also a bit shit. I mean, it just sort of, it just sort of breaks, you know, or doesn't, um, the job just doesn't complete or, I mean, it takes a long time as well, you know, so as a business person, I'm sort of concerned about its performance and, you know, the, the potential for it to scale endlessly and make, you know, like the grand vision of museum in a box is we've got a thousand museums using it. They all could 50 or a thousand objects into this giant pool so teachers can pull. It, it just could be really huge. And then I look at stuff like this and I'm well, ooh, you know, that's not, I don't know how to make that scalable without going down the molding route. And I don't know what the tipping point yet is from viable 3D printing on demand to molded printing, which is great for, you know, when you're printing lots of stuff. But anyway, we've been doing sort of experiments with treatments of these things. So this is um, one of those white plasticky prints which we just sort of spray paint. And she looks much more valuable than she actually is when you use a bit of spray paint. 
Um, but we're also working with other form factors too. And this, uh, I bought a set of postcards from the BM shop for about six quid, which is about, um, uh, you know, many, many times less uh, expensive than those fancy 3D prints. And the interaction is identical. And I, in fact, for 2D works, you would go with cards or, or prints anyway. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it. And now I think um, uh, we're happy to answer some questions if you like, but um, we can set that up and you can have a play with it too. And as I mentioned, we're very close to this part of the world. So if you fancy coming to say hi, um, you're welcome to come for a visit. Um, and that's my email address, which we can maybe leave up for a second. Um, but yeah, so happy to answer some questions. Or that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I think we might turn off the Ooh. because we're not going to pick up all the discussion. Okay. Right. Stop sharing. The, uh, Sorry, anyone who's yeah. there. I've got to say hello to the internet. Should Thanks we say? Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Bye. Great. Stop broadcast as yeah. well. Yep. Yeah. Okay.